So just to remind you that uh, this is not a private, but rather a recorded conversation that will eventually be made available to the public. Um, if at any point in the conversation you need to take a break, let me know, or if you want to change topics. Um, so today is Thursday, October 25th, 2018. My name is Andy Reisinger, and I am interviewing Reba Bolt here in the Department of Special Collections and Archives uh, at Georgia State University as part of the Great Speckleberg Oral History Project. Uh, and once again, before beginning, uh, if I can get your verbal consent to be recorded. You got it. Okie doke. Um, Still in force. <laughs> so we were, we had a nice, nice several hours talking yesterday and... What was it, about three hours? I think three and a half, four, something like that. Oh, okay. Um, and we covered your, where you came from, your, your family's background, your youth, schooling, um, military, I will not say service, you corrected me on that. <laughs> Exploitation. Um, an early career and, and moving to Atlanta and working for the, the Southern Regional Office of the ACLU. Working for the guy that didn't send me to Wrightsville. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, so we've got some ground to cover today. Um, and specifically uh, talking about the bird. Um, I did want to follow up, I was thinking, last evening. You mentioned a couple times yesterday connections that you had with SNCC, the Southern Student Nonviolent... Southern... Not, stu not <laughs> Southern. Yeah, Student Nonviolent Coordinated Committee. Um, and particularly through uh, George? George Ware, yeah. Yes. Um, and, and was there a Jim as well? Jim Woodruff is the guy that introduced me to George. Okay. Um, and I don't, I don't think we, we talked about, how did you come to know them? That is among the things that I mentioned yesterday that traces back to um, my traces back to desegregation of the law school. Uh, I became, as I mentioned yesterday, good friends with the uh, black student who was admitted as, he wasn't the first, I think he was the third uh, black person at the law school, but uh, f during my first year he was the only one there and uh, we became good friends and as a result, well, the racists are right about that. Uh, in some situations, integration works. <laughs> the white people and the black people start hanging out together. Mm -hmm. And was there something conscious on your part of intentionally seeking out this fellow classmate, or? I think so. I mean, I didn't really, uh, think it through as clearly as we would state it, or as you have stated it. But, uh, yeah, it was conscious. And then through your friendship with him, you came to... We have, have a friendship with, with Jim um, Woodruff, and um, then the other friendships that we, that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, Jim was the Episcopal chaplain for the uh, uh, at least two black universities, uh, Fisk and Tennessee State. He served as chaplain for both. Yeah, they're, they're roughly next door to each other. Mm -hmm. Well, not really. Not you, you have to go up the hill a ways. It, it's beyond walking. <laughs> but uh, anyway, he had both. And through that friendship and, I guess just leave it characterized as friendship, how did that bring you in, into the circle of SNCC and their work? 
or did it? It did. Uh, the um, way it brought me in was that, uh, excuse me, I, I keep stumbling over Jim's last name because I have a good friend who I'm going to see this weekend named Jim Woodruff. No, Jim Woodford. Oh, that is confusing. And Jim Woodruff is uh, the guy who, he do, he was developing a friendship with the Snake people by what route, I don't, probably never knew, certainly don't recall. Um, I do recall uh, uh, he had taken, a, at some point in this friendship, he took a trip to the West Coast, came back proudly announcing that uh, I'm no longer black, I'm Afro-American. Anyway, uh, it's, it's like it just all pretty much developed um, normally, or to use a word that used to be popular for such normal things, organically. Yes. And, uh, that was, uh, this is something we didn't mention yesterday. Uh, that was um, during that time, Vanderbilt's um, impact. Is it impact? The annual symposium they have every year? I don't I'm know. Sure. Whatever it was. They still do it, I think. Uh, have some speakers of interest. And uh, one year, well, Jim and I were close. Uh, they uh, had the speaker, the principal advertised speaker, was Stokely Carmichael. And uh, I went to Stokely's presentation at Tennessee State and also at Vanderbilt. And uh, so did a lot of other people some of whom, I guess, I don't know if this was the allegation, uh, rioted <laughs> the night after it was over. And uh, other accounts of it have the riot because uh, some students were out walking around and the cops came. Mm -hmm. And uh, that riot is so-called riot. It was sometimes uh, attributed to Stokely but, uh, in the testimony before the Congressional Committee that it went to. Wow. Big deal, in other words. Uh, it was uh, the, the cause of what I just said. That it was just some slightly routine or slightly out of the ordinary activity by some students that attracted police presence. And uh, the police had been gearing up for this for days anyway. So uh, the police came and they wouldn't leave and people kept telling them, you know, if you get the police out of here, everything will be all right. And uh, that was the last thing the police wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, a lot of stuff happened and um, um, some of the uh, state people were uh, in town for it, you know, traveling. To, you know, the group, and uh, they, a few weeks later, I think it was weeks, not much later, um, Bill Kunstler came to town to file and try a lawsuit against uh, the city and the police for starting the riot. And uh, at that time, we were still in the era, or we were just, we were still moving into, but we were there in the era when SNCC had, uh, as they referred to it, kicked the white people out. And, um, and was Stokely chair of SNCC at this time, do you think? Is that why he was? He I'm was not sure whether Rap Brown had, or, I mean, he is now had uh, taken over from his chair yet. Yeah, I think he had, 
but anyway, Stokely was still very prominent in, mm -hmm. in all of that. And uh, anyway, uh, Consular filed, or his, he and his people he worked with in New York filed the lawsuit. Uh, one of several filed around the South over similar things. And uh, the hearing that we had, they had, uh, went on for about a week. And uh, the, and I went to it. I had already by that time um, tendered my resignation to the law office I was working in, which was my father's firm. Not technically totally his, but he was the number one named partner at that point. And um, Somehow it developed that uh, every day after the court, uh, a lot of the involved people would come over to my house to just a party. And, you know, there's a, this doesn't need excusing, but I'll excuse it anyway. Uh, civil rights is a very hard, very stressful business, and sometimes even deadly. And so the chances to blow off steam were important to the life of the program. And they would blow off some steam uh, over at my house at, at night, even though my house was, not only was I white, it was a white neighborhood. <laughs> and uh, the at one point, see, we had a chair in the living room, uh, uh, a wicker armchair about the size of these in this room, and uh, not big and luxurious like this one. And uh, me, I, uh, I was I was talking to uh, Jim Woodruff, and uh, he interrupted whatever it was I was saying, and he said, and he pointed to one of the chairs, and it was Rap Brown was asleep in it, <laughs> and just looking all beat out and everything, and uh, uh, Jim said, he doesn't look very dangerous, does he? <laughs> Anyway, that, I guess we could call another uh, formative event. I was um, hanging out with Consular and the guys from SNCC, and um, hey, there was no turning back. Did Consular prevail in the case? No. No. Several, I said, I mentioned that there have been several of those cases mm -hmm. he was involved in and filed around the South and uh, I don't know, Louisville, Atlanta, I don't know where else. <coughs> um, and uh, the, some of them accomplished their stated goal, others, such as the one in Nashville, um, accomplished only. Uh, the goal of bringing people together and publicizing things and everything. It was, it was, although I'm not a fan of bringing lawsuits for values other than winning the case, uh, that could be an exception to that rule. It, it did produce some fallout, favorable fallout, other than just, um, other than winning, which our side didn't do. And what was the favorable fallout? How would you describe that? Well, it's a number of small things, such as cementing my cement and so, I don't know, but finalizing, you might say, uh, my being uh, sucked into 
the civil rights movement, or, as it was more accurately described then, the black power movement. And other, there, were, there were a lot of little things like that. I'm not, I'm not saying that there was any big event from it, but uh, the, um, the trip to Washington, for example, is uh, to, to testify for one of these SNCC people, Fred Brooks, to testify at the, um, as it was known then, the McClellan Committee. It had previously had a more famous name, McCarthy Committee. Um, and uh, that was a major subject that they went into in their hearings, including the um, questioning of uh, Fred. Questioning him about what? About that, well, about various things. Uh, mainly about uh, is it the civil rights movement or at least SNCC and something else, Black Liberation, something or other. Black, Black Liberation Army, maybe, I don't know. Uh, were violent and had departed from the announced goal of uh, can we all get along? Rodney King had not yet said that. <laughs> That was the roughly sort of odorized version of um, the civil rights movement saying what they were about. Mm -hmm. And um, that testimony is reported in the congressional record. And uh, I wrote uh, several pages of. Did I yesterday mention the book I wrote a few pages of? I believe I did. Anyway, there was the voices of civil rights. Yeah, lawyers. voices of yeah. civil rights lawyers. Um, um, my contribution to that uh, book was about our mainly about uh, my and Fred's trip to Washington, an appearance before McClellan, the real asshole. <laughs> and what was it that that you were stating in your testimony? Well, I didn't testify. I was the lawyer advising the, the witness. Okay. And um, the, it would be very helpful to me in answering that to reread the testimony in the mm -hmm. congressional record. Uh, sure. I read it pretty thoroughly a couple of years ago when I was writing that piece for the book. And, yeah. Uh, it was mainly uh, McClellan, uh, mainly the, the other members of the committee were active in the questioning, but um, uh, he was clearly the leader. And uh, it was to establish, well, at two levels. At the more important level, uh, the more direct level for them was uh, to uh, discredit the civil rights movement and black people generally in any way they could. And uh, the principal way during that episode of uh, discrediting was uh, to uh, point out about how violent it was. And uh, they were blaming SNCC for starting the riot. And uh, uh, Nashville had at that time a guy, uh, a policeman who had uh, come to Nashville from, I think, New York, somewhere in the north, I'm pretty sure in New York, uh, named John Sirachi. And uh, Sirachi was uh, head of what was, I don't know its name, but it was de facto a Red Squad. For and, the city? Yeah. And uh, it Red is the wrong name because it concentrated on black people. But it did accuse them of being Reds, so that was um, germane to the committee's purpose. I said there were two points. That was the main point. The uh, subsidiary point of the way they got there was to uh, tar SNCC and other black liberation groups uh, with, as, with a brush that looked as bad as possible to white people. And um, that was during the summer of 1967, which was a very active 
summer for uh, urban disturbances, shall we say. Yes. And, uh, and were you already on with the ACLU at that point? Because you no. moved to Atlanta in 67. Yeah, but, well, it was actually January 1st, 68. Oh, okay. Okay. And uh, the I did a number of things that summer with the guys from SNCC, and uh, a number of those things got written up in the local newspapers. <clears throat> the evening paper was far right wing, the morning paper was very liberal. And what, what were those called? Those the people? morning paper was the Nashville Tennessean, and the evening paper was the Nashville Banner. Can you tell where they are? <laughs> and um, my father had fairly recently at that point been um, retained by the Banner to be its lawyer. And uh, the uh, publisher of the banner, a guy named James Stallman, uh, S-T-A-H-L-M-A-N, and I have read somewhere since then that uh, some, something biographical about him, that he had an inferiority feeling because he didn't fit in to Nashville high society because of his German name. So he, he overcompensated for that. Mm -hmm. And he, um, as I say, hired my father to be his lawyer, and I did some work on his will, actually. And uh, he had written his own will in the same kind of florid language he used in his newspaper to, uh, the will didn't condemn liberals and civil rights people and black people generally, like, um, he did in the newspaper, but it was the same rhetorical style. And so um, it can be said that I had just before all this stuff involving the banner uh, got published, uh, uh, I had, in a very real sense, been the publisher's lawyer or the, or the paper's lawyer, however you want to put that. And uh, so, in, toward the end of the summer, after some, oh, well, that, this is after, after any, let first tell you about the event that was being referred to in this piece in the paper. Um, uh, George Ware had uh, said to me sometime a week or so ahead of the event, uh, he, he said, he and I decided to have a little SNCC fundraiser at my house. And so we invited a number of my friends over to just hang out, meet the SNCC people, get on the list for contributing money that people hoped. And where would these friends, are these childhood friends, friends from college, law school? They were maybe then current friends. Uh, some lawyers, some just people I knew and who weren't lawyers. Uh, they uh, sort of a liberal set of sort of a liberal set. I thought that uh, a member of the liberal set would be a lawyer that I didn't know very well, uh, knew it very casually, very pleasantly named Charles Galbraith. He later became a judge, so he's written up somewhere. Uh, Charlie Galbraith uh, came and, okay, just like everybody else. I, I didn't know of anything wrong with that. This was on a Saturday night. Monday morning, George was arrested 
by the National Police, its Red Squad, for um, sedition. Turns out Charlie and a, uh, I don't know how good a friend, I can at least say clearly an acquaintance of his, another lawyer named, first name, I think his first name was Jack, Jack Kershaw. had gone down to the courthouse or the police station or wherever you do that and swore out a warrant for George for sedition because George had said to uh, something to the effect in talking to Charlie that uh, we're going to win by any means necessary. <laughs> so that, that seditious utterance uh, resulted in George spending a week in jail. He refused to make bail. And uh, the banner carried on its front page a little uh, bold-faced type box about that big, a couple of inches, or a little less actually, I think. And um, it said, I didn't bring the exact language with me, but it was something to the effect that uh, Mayor Beverly Briley, who had not been much involved in anything, Mayor Be Beverly B Briley wants to make it clear that the Reaver Bowl Jr. referred to in these pages many times as lawyer for Snick and George Ware and so forth, uh, is not a member of the law firm of both Hunt, Cummings, and Connors, and has not been a member, has not worked at that firm for two months or some, some short time like that. And uh, so uh, I've, uh, many years later, when I'm making a trip to Nashville, I went to the library and uh, found that issue of the banner and uh, copied it photocopied the, um, that little box on the front page, or the part of the front page that had that little box on it. And uh, it's on my wall at home now. So um, you asked me yesterday how the family took things. Well, there's an example I didn't get to yet. You know that the paper's lawyer had something to do with uh, that little box. The lawyer who is my father. Yes. But chose to do it in a, in a public way rather than a personal confrontation with you. It was just a public yeah, statement. Yeah, yeah. Clearly letting his feelings known to you. Yeah, at one of those uh, sessions at my house after court, uh, one of the um, snake members was sitting on the bed at my house, and uh, we were just, I don't know, chatting. And he looked up at me and says, You know, oh, we were smoking a joint. Statute of limitations is run on that, right? Yes. I, I, actually, I don't know, but... I'm, I'm, I'm talking to the camera. <laughs> uh, Sounds good to me. Yeah. And uh, we were smoking a joint, and as he passed it to me, or me to him, I don't know, uh, he, um, he looked up at me and says, do you think that if we get out and march for marijuana, like we did for civil rights, we can make it legal. <laughs> Here we are, 50 years later, making it legal. Steady as she goes. And how did the case for George being charged with sedition, how did that end up? I filed a petition for habeas corpus pre-trial. I didn't know anything about how to do these things. I'd never done it before. So I had to go kind of by the seat of my pants and um, stuff I had read, and news I had read, including news I had read. 
and um, we had a hearing in the criminal court, excuse me, in the criminal court in Nashville, uh, state court, and um, we didn't win that hearing either, but the uh, district attorney, was a good guy, a friend of mine actually, uh, Tommy Shriver was his name, if you're making archival notes there. <laughs> Uh, he's been dead for some years now. Uh, he, um, I think it was Tommy, it may have been a, no, more likely it was uh, somebody else in the DA's office. But, uh, yeah, I got the news from somebody else in the DA's office. I, got, I think it was a guy named John Hollins. Um, Dropped the case. Dropped it. Total drop. It was over, and, and, and in the blink of an eye. And then I guess you George had done about a week mm -hmm. by then, and uh, so um, he's mentioned on that same front page that's hanging on the wall. And I guess you and all the other folks at the party as well as the... Not all. But the, the other people the, at the party and, and the, the uh, general public found out pretty quickly that, that this person that had sworn out the affidavit was not, was not friendly to the cause. Well, the affidavit itself, or the warrant application, uh, pretty clearly stated that. Yeah. And uh, that pretty clearly was the objective of Charlie Galbraith and Jack Kershaw. To, uh, they uh, were, not Jack, but Charlie was an example of uh, a liberal who held things back, held back progress. And you had mentioned that in going and uh, <clears throat> making this case for habeas corpus that you're flying by the, the seat of your pants. I was going to ask, did, did you have any mentors, uh, folks to bounce ideas off of, where you just sort of reading and, and trying to figure, literally figure this out, stumbling, <laughs> stumbling through? Well, I bounced a few ideas around with George Barrett, who has recently died. He was uh, the town's leading leftist lawyer at that time. Um, George actually wasn't all that helpful either at that point because he shared some of the liberal bias against SNCC. But uh, that was no big deal. Uh, he was going to do the job for the rights, regardless of his own personal uh, opinion, that uh, he wouldn't do it the way Stick was doing it. And uh, I shared ideas a good bit with a, you know, George was a little older, <coughs> and uh, one of my exact contemporaries, a guy from Nashville, a lawyer named Whit Stokes, Whitworth Stokes, Junior the Third, or some number, I think, and from a prominent Nashville family, and um, and Tony Cresswell was good to kick ideas around with, and. So I wasn't totally alone. Mm -hmm. The then nascent ACLU affiliate uh, didn't really get much involved, so I can't really include those people as in your description of who I talked to. But they were generally supportive. There's no problem. It just wasn't wasn't their case at that point. Because who had, I 
is this sort of a new departure for SNCC that in you and them culti cultivating a relationship in Nashville, or had there been, was there, were there other lawyers that had been representing civil rights causes with, I don't know, the NAACP or, or something in Nashville? Yeah, there were. Um, there was uh, Avon Williams was one of them. Uh, Alexander Luby was another one of them. Luby was a very highly respected elderly man. Um, he uh, spoke with uh, an island accent and, um, from where he was, where he'd come from. And um, I didn't have much contact with them in the context of this particular case we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But yes, uh, in general, the answer to your question is at least includes those two names and probably others that I'm forgetting now. There's a guy, there was a lawyer in Nashville that I didn't know very well, uh, barely knew him at all, uh, named Adolph or Adolphus, I think it was Adolphus, AA, with his initials, Birch, Birch with a U, okay. and um, who was not active in any way I knew of that time, but there were a lot of people doing things that I didn't know of and uh, doing them kind of under the radar because they were getting them done rather than going to jail themselves or getting the good publicity I got. About it. I'm not there anymore. Uh, uh, who? But I bring his name up because I've read uh, relatively recently that uh, he uh, ascended to the state Supreme Court. And yeah, I can't emphasize too much the point that I just made, that there were a lot of people doing things that we never even heard about. Mm -hmm. Would you characterize yourself on the, the younger end, though, of, of lawyers sympathetic and willing to get involved? Yeah, and more uh, contemporaries of at least the, the folks in the SNCC. Yeah, the, the, the lawyers I've named, um, well, a couple of answers. One of the lawyers I've named um, were not particularly active with SNCC, were not active at all to the extent that I know. Again, is the under the radar stuff. And I wasn't, I was a, the new boy on the block. I wasn't privy to all that. Um, uh, neighborhood stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, a lot of work was done that I never, still have never heard of. Yeah. And you left town shortly, shortly few, after. A few months this. later. Yeah. And come to Atlanta and then, did you, did that, the personal relationships with with your friends in SNCC and as well as the professional counsel that you were offering, did that continue uh, when you joined the ACLU? Yeah. camera quickly. It's still recording, huh? Yes, yes. Good uh, to have that assurance, reassurance. Uh, I would, from time to time, uh, in Atlanta, visit um, the place where George and Ernest Stevens, another stick, stick person that frequently traveled with George, uh, and others had rented a house, and I would occasionally visit them there. Where was that house? It was, I couldn't find it now, but I best I can put this together, it was somewhere east of downtown, and that 
that boulevard area. Um, anyway, I went, went by there one day for no particular reason. Uh, wasn't doing anything. I thought it was time to visit. And um, the house wasn't there. It was gone, down to the ground, burnt up. And I mentioned to one of its occupants later, there were none there at that point, they were gone too. Uh, later I mentioned to one of its occupants having what I had seen, and uh, he said, yeah, that, that damn thing, it, it just burned down. <laughs> they, they had had some problems with the landlord because they were with Snake. <laughs> Them house just burned. And what did you read from that statement? They burned it. But that's just a surmise. I don't know that. Right, right. But clearly tensions were running that high. That yeah. something like that could potentially have happened. Yeah. And did the, you mentioned that the summer of 67, the, a lot of unrest and... Uh, that was uh, the most unrestful summer of the era. Yeah. Nationwide. And over the course of the next three years that you're working with the ACLU and then you go on with, with Al Horn in the law project? Not directly. If I got my timeline straight here, and I may not, but uh, before Al and I and others, including Stephanie, who I'm, and Tom, who I'm staying with on this trip, uh, had, um, before we started the law project, I spent a year in Japan uh, staying uh, right next to a American Marine uh, air station there in the city of Iwakuni. And um, advising with and doing some organizing with uh, members of the Marine Corps who were stationed there who were sympathetic to our causes and opposed to the war. And uh, part of my mission there was to make sure they stayed sympathetic or make them, get them to be more sympathetic. And get people who had never even heard of these issues to become sympathetic, things like that. And under whose auspices was this or you just it was under the auspices that and three or four other such projects in Asia were under the auspices, and later in Germany, were under the auspices of uh, principally of the National Guardians Guild, which had, I say principally because um, the, um, it took money and the Guild was able as was common in those days, uh, to get a foundation grant for such things, and they had gotten a foundation grant to send several lawyers and legal assistants to Asia to uh, work with GIs. Bear in mind in this regard that uh, <clears throat> the draft, I don't think, had yet been abolished. and. Um, People were not drafted into any branch of the military except the Army. And uh, the other branches, like the Marines, <coughs> that I was working with, uh, <coughs> the Marines that I was working with um, were so-called volunteers, of course, impelled by the draft. So, the, so they're not like uh, Mentally, at least, they're not like the uh, volunteers 
the so-called volunteers for the various branches of the military in these days. Mm -hmm. Which contributes a little bit to um, to my, I said this yesterday, but I don't recall whether it was in this interview or not. It was, so uh, it contributes to my process that I'm presently in of changing my mind about opposition to the draft. Right, right. You did mention that. And so you spent a year in Japan. Yeah. Did you go by yourself, or did your whole family? Um, my daughter, Robin, went with me. Okay. Uh, she was kind of, uh, I don't know, I, I can't think of any conclusory way to describe her participation, but I think she had a good time. I know she had a few bad times. <laughs> And this is in the early 70s? Uh, I think. I've, I've, I've thought about this before, and I have a hard time reconstructing uh, like the timeline I just referred to mm -hmm. uh, on that, but it would have been around between 70 and 72, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had uh, a newspaper, the Marine Corps, motto, one of them, they got several, but the one they were especially pushing in those days uh, was uh, Semper Fidelis, usually abbreviated to Semper Fi, mm -hmm. which was the name of our newspaper. It was mimeographed, a mimeographed newspaper. Are you uh, young enough to have seen, ever seen one of those? I am. It was put out weekly, um, handed out around the base. The authorities hated it. Mm -hmm. How many how many folks were working with you on this project? Oh, I didn't finish the answer on that, but uh, where I was, see the projects that the guild and its financial benefactor were uh, sponsoring was um, were in. Iwakuni, Okinawa, something in and out uh, of the Philippines, um, Suit Bay and Olongapo. And um, mm, off and on there was one, that, uh, it was not guild sponsored, but it was in northern Japan, so there was, there was such a project there. And uh, uh, that was would have been, uh, no, I'm not sure. We mainly did Marine and Army people. The um, other branches were harder to organize, a lot like the Navy. Uh, the people that would settle down in one place in the Navy is stationed in one place in a settled way. Um, we're hard to organize or we didn't organize. I don't know. I, I think they probably mostly fall in the category, like I mentioned yesterday, of uh, Air Force and such as that. People who had better conditions and didn't, and didn't get shot at. Um, I mentioned that the Air Force is a particular problem these days. Uh, and one of the reasons is, uh, I believe, I have, I have no authority for this, except my own belief and observation over the years. Uh, they have no um, uh, yeah, they, they have a sort of an inferiority conflict, complex in relation to the other uh, branches because they don't get shot at. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, they also are way more skilled and enthusiastic 
and using uh, Christianity as their organizing tool. And um, uh, did I mention yesterday that there is an organization? I did mention somebody about the Military Religious Foundation. Yes. yes. Religious Freedom Foundation. Um, so, uh, you know, that kind of uh, stuff is still going on. So the office in Japan that you're in... Excuse me. Yeah. I didn't finish the answer to your question. Right. How many other people were there mm -hmm. besides my daughter um, and the Marines. But uh, there was one other position there, a non-lawyer, uh, purely an organizer, who helped with the newspaper and talking to the people and things like that. His name was... Well, he still... He's still an activist, and his name is uh, Bruce Hartford. He had done some uh, labor organizing and other things, and I had never even heard of him when I went there, but we spent the year together. Had he already been there when you arrived, or did you guys come at the same time? Approximately at the same time. Mm -hmm. I think he got there a few days ahead of me, but I don't know. And did the uh, excuse me, and the people at these projects that are named off, named the projects, uh, that were, um, they were sponsored, I guess is the right word, by, not by the Lawyers Guild, but by another group which called itself Pacific Counseling Service. And so, Bruce, Bruce's expenses were paid by Pacific Counseling Service, mine were paid by the Lawyers Guild. And we worked for nothing but expenses. Mm -hmm. And was your daughter in, in an American school there? She was not in school there. Okay. And, uh, she has become a right winger, as has my son, who was who was not involved in much of anything at that point. But uh, he has. Um, I think I don't. I, I'm not. Gonna, I'm not going to get into my family with you. Yeah. I will ask though. Did did your your wife and son stay in Atlanta, or did they yes. go back? Yeah. We were, my wife and I were, I pretty, yes, I'm pretty sure by then broken up. Mm -hmm. The marriage was broken up. I, it wasn't officially declared broken by a court, but other than that, it was, it was gone. Yeah. yeah. How, how did the fact that you had been in the military, in the Navy, inform, impact the work that you were doing on that project? I think, in a general and sort of vague way, it informed it a lot because it gave me a bank of knowledge to draw on about how the military does things. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the day-to-day -day operation, I didn't really uh, draw on that bank a whole lot. Do you think that there was any, that it provided an entry point or a sort of fellow feeling, uh, common vernacular point of experience? Yeah, with all, all of those to some extent, but none to a large extent. Okay. And how would you retrospectively assess um, how successful you all were? 
Well, in a sense, and as I said yesterday, we were extremely successful because the war ended. And I believe, this is less clear, but I, I believe that uh, the uh, GI movement was instrumental in bringing the war to an end. Because it, it taught the guys that were uh, running the war uh, that they couldn't just um, willy-nilly run any war they wanted to because they couldn't get uh, the manpower and it was all manpower then, uh, to uh, fight the war. And uh, so there was a lot of desertion, there was a lot of dissent, there was a, a lot of things. Um, you know, I told you about uh, the thing at Fort McClellan yesterday, and uh, that stuff was going on all over. They, uh, they really needed to get rid of that draft if they were going to accomplish their goals. And uh, finally they did, and uh, it's a lot easier for the military to get away with stuff like that, or for the administration in Washington, whether the military part of it or not, to get away with um, accomplishing their goals, which I disagree with. <laughs> and that's why I'm in the process of changing my mind about opposition to the draft, although in those days it was very important. I, and as I said yesterday, I did a lot of that work. Right. I wanted to, to go back to um, the topic of your representation of, of SNCC and civil rights more generally. Um, in what we were just discussing, it sort of seems like a high watermark, 1967, for a lot of the, the legal work that you were doing, or at least that's what we discussed. So can you can you talk more of, was that a high watermark, or yeah, did yeah. things continue? 60, 67 was a high watermark for a number of things in that general area. and. Uh, the most visible of those things were the uh, big disturbances in the big cities. And uh, that was not generally the mission of civil rights anyway, but uh, it was all of the years of frustration and getting beaten up and people getting killed and uh, living on the subsistence whatevers uh, while doing civil rights work and all of that had pretty well uh, taken their toll on a lot of people by then, and so uh, to, it was pretty clear that, uh, well, in retrospect, I don't think it was pretty clear, but it was um, what they had been doing, it seemed, I should say, it seemed to not be working. And so a change of tactics was called for, and uh, you saw a lot of urban riots then. And a lot of other stuff too. <coughs> the, the language of black power, which is still with us, that language is still with us, um, was um, quite different from the usual civil rights language. And that was one of the points that uh, Senator McClellan and his boys were trying to make with us or to the public rather about us. Excuse me. Did that answer the question? I think I digressed a little bit. No, that did. Okay. Did your friendships and, and personal relationships with with the folks that you had come to know pretty pretty intimately at that point, did those endure over the next couple of years, or with the oh, the next change? couple over the cup next couple of years for sure mm -hmm. uh, until well, like the present day, <coughs> um, some of them endured in the sense of why I'm here talking to you, the great speckled bird. That was uh, from friendships and relations from that era, and a good many of those are still enduring. 
my friendship with George Ware uh, went into remission for a little while, but then got revived fairly a few years ago, uh, basically just in time for George and I to be in close touch uh, when he was dying. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ernest Stevens, uh, his buddy, was already dead, so <clears throat> death has taken its toll which I'm sure is why somebody decided to set you up, interviewing people like me, to, to preserve our stories uh, beyond our death, which is way more imminent than it was 50 years ago, or 40 years ago, whenever we were doing all this. Right. I haven't done all the arithmetic on that. And you said that with George, that the friendship went into remission for a little while. Was that just... We were just out of touch. Yeah. We were in different cities. And, right. Um, anyway, we, we revived it after a good many years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, I, I never did totally understand the dimension of this, but uh, he was doing a lot of stuff in the music business then. In his? In his life. Life after? Yeah, yeah he had moved to Philadelphia. And, uh, and was no longer chaplain. No, George was never a chaplain. Oh, that was Jim. Yeah. Okay. And Jim died kind of right, right, right. in between eras. Okay, sorry. And uh, he, uh, I'm not sure where I'm uh, headed with this right now, but um, And I, now I'm lost, so let's move on, or move back to it with any question you can think of. I, I, I got one. Um, so in talking about enduring friendships, you, you mentioned the bird. We haven't touched on that very much. So you, as, as you uh, corrected me a few minutes ago, moved to Atlanta January 1st, 68. How did you come to gain the friendship and be aware of of these people that were involved with the Great Speckled Bird and the Great Speckled Bird, which began publication just three months after you moved here. Well, before that in inaugural issue, three months later, uh, he, uh, we, um, or I, didn't know any of these people. They were totally new to me, but the bird was doing something that appealed to me and needed to do it and I liked it and uh, so I don't recall exactly how I looked them up or got connected but in those days it was pretty easy to get connected so not something you would necessarily recall it was so ordinary <laughs> and uh, anyway it did come to be and uh, so here here I am with you so just you after they began publication, you were just a reader, and I was a little a chord with you. So you, no, I, I was more than a reader, <coughs> and I, I was a lawyer, did legal work for him, as we discussed yeah. yesterday. And um, the I was also more than a reader in the sense that I occasionally went to their editorial meetings. Right, but initially, like you hadn't known them or been in conversations as they're developing the concept and and I had their first entry point to them was the physical publication. And I hadn't been associated with any physical publications uh, except uh, in high school me and a few friends um, put out a, uh, a sort of underground newspaper at our high school. Really? Called the Grub Street Journal. And we only put out one issue. We got in a lot of trouble for that. And, yeah, uh, talk, talk about that a bit. I don't have a whole lot to say beyond a lot of trouble. And uh, what was the content? What was the what content? Was the was street set, satiric, satirical stuff about uh, our school and our classmates. And did Grub Street refer to anything or just Grub Yeah, we had learned in our English class at the public high school that 
bring me back to that later. Uh, we had learned in our English class uh, that uh, somebody, some literary person in England had uh, put out something, some kind of publication with Grub Street in its name, or they worked on Grub Street. I'm not sure of all the details of that. I probably wasn't very sure of it even then, but it was something we had learned in school, and uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a funny name, so we adopted it. Mm -hmm. And by in England, I don't mean in England. Then currently, I mean in England. Yeah. Um, Hundred years ago. Century, yeah. yeah. And so it was a satirical cheat. To the extent that high school students can master the art of satire, yes. I sort of hesitated to use that word because I'm not sure how, how high school students can actually be satirical. But At least it, it, it was critical of the way that your school operated. Yeah, but it wasn't really very critical because uh, we were just mainly making fun rather than uh, an intellectual criticism. And what sort of trouble did that result in? Uh, they uh, threatened to throw us out of school and um, called up our parents and my father came in and uh, talked to the principal and uh, uh, he worked out a deal, I think. Uh, I wasn't. We weren't in on all of the conversations. Uh, worked out a deal that uh, we wouldn't put out that newspaper anymore. And it was probably another part to the deal that I don't even remember. And uh, we would not be thrown out of school. And or we had already been thrown out. We'd get back in. And is this post the school burning down and you having spent yeah. your stint at the private school and sat on your daddy's knee and promised that you'd, you'd tow the line? if you could go back to public school? Yeah, um, those are two different events, sitting on his knee and uh, promising to whatever I had to do to get back in school uh, were different events, but that they both happened, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think me sitting on the knee had happened earlier. I was probably a little smaller then. Okay. But he, tur he turned his eye on didn't force you to go back to private school. Right, and I have since learned um, from some school observation, uh, which has in part come, small part, come from being a substitute teacher for a while after I couldn't stomach being a lawyer anymore. Wow. And uh, I got fired from that too. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, and more so from uh, uh, my grandchildren, just observing what they say and what they do and what they talk about, uh, that uh, the, um, a big difference, well, the key word there is difference, because uh, in those days, there was no difference in uh, curriculum that I ever saw uh, in my brief so sojourn at a private school, uh, there was no difference between the uh, subject matter of the education and in the private and the public schools. These days, <coughs> there's a vast difference. The private school students have taught more, and, um, or at least more about, more subject, more hard information, and less, um, I think, I'm not sure about this part, but I'll throw it in as a possibility, and less about how to think. And uh, it's like, uh, it's like my granddaughter, again, I'm getting a little confused. Um, things I said yesterday, who did I say them to? But right, here, right. Here's one I don't think I said to you. No, we didn't talk about any. My, in recent times, a couple of years ago, a year ago maybe, no, no, real, real recent in other words, um, one of my grandchildren, well, all of my grandchildren, no, not all of them, one of them and the father, my son, my, grand, my son uh, were 
riding in a beautiful mountain area of New Mexico, doing uh, this, this people visiting kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, we saw a beautiful view, we were commenting on the beauty of the view. And uh, the, the one of the three grand, three of his children, uh, commented as we were all commenting on the beauty of the view, uh, admiring me, and Obama can't take it away from us. And I have no idea whether she learned that line of thinking, well I do have an idea, at school, at her private school, or at home. Uh, my idea is both. But I've never been told mm -hmm. that, but uh, we, I have been told several other things that are, um, that told me that uh, the kids at the private schools are being told things different, at least different from, a sub, from what a substitute teacher comes across. In a public school? Yeah. And the, you uh, the, the, the motto that I figured out for uh, substitute te teachers is the guiding principle is substitutes don't know shit. Mm -hmm. And were you terminated because you challenged that? Yeah, in, in, in a sense, it is part of the whole, and uh, that this part of that whole being um, that. Um, that I was gone in one morning to teach Marine Corps Junior ROTC. Oh no. And so I started out with saying that I just heard on the radio in the, in the day before, very, very close in time, of a uh, Department of Defense study that says that uh, sexual assault is rampant in all of the, throughout the military but particularly so, more so, in the Marines. And uh, obviously the regular teacher, a retired Marine officer, um, didn't agree with that. And it was, in fact, he had some stuff in there, just incredible stuff. There was a magazine lauding the Ku Klux Klan founder. <laughs> anyway, we, we didn't get into that. I just happened to see that was on the mm -hmm. uh, table of reading materials for the kids. And um, it was, uh, he had debriefed some of the students who were really, who had really enthusiastic, in, in my observation, who had really enthusiastically adopted his attitude. And uh, so they told him some version, a pretty garbled version, but some version of my thing about uh, sexual assault being a problem in the military. And um, that, that, that retired colonel uh, <laughs> again I have as um, as that guy on the radio, Norman Goldman said, keeps saying, I have no facts to back this up, but I'm sure I saw it. Uh, that, uh, the, uh, uh, he was resentful of that kind of talk, my kind of talk about problems with um, sexual assault disapproving talk about problems with sexual assault because it was messing with his playground. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, uh, they fired me on account of that and I went through a long and involved uh, uh, hearing process, three hearings, and I finally, when it got but to- Before the school board? The first two, yeah, not the board necessarily, but the school employees. Okay. And uh, the third one, um, a 
according to the way the plan is laid out, was before um, it was before an ex judge who did those kinds of things, uh, adjudicatory things outside the judgeships, um, to kind of beat my age and wind down our careers. And he wound that one down by reinstating me. Did you continue on with it after that, or did you No, I had had all I wanted to yeah. deal with on that, so I got a, seemed to me, decent amount of back pay for the time I'd been out and never went back. Fair enough. When we were talking about your uh, The, the Grub Street paper that you put out, you, you said to remind you you wanted to come back to something. Yeah, what did I want to come back to? I'm not sure. Um, well, no, I don't know either, so let's keep yeah. going. So, getting back to the, the Great Speckled Bird, early in its publication, you were reading it, picking it up, I don't know, from a street seller, a newsstand, or something. Something like that. Um, uh, street seller then. Later they got uh, uh, boxes mm -hmm. that you could put a quarter in. But then it was, I think the first few issues were free. I'm not sure about that. They, they may have been a quarter, or they may have started that quarter. Or, yeah. Um, and so. Anyway, it was. If it was a quarter, it was a quarter well spent. And clearly you were intrigued, sympathetic, mm -hmm. and then sought them out somehow. Mm -hmm. It was pretty easy to see, as I kind of indicated a while ago, it's easy to see things like that out. It was all in one neighborhood. And were you a regular of the Strip? No, but I, I was living close to the Strip, so I was regularly walking through there, driving through there. Were you shopping at the shops, going to the, the coffee houses? Well, not, not much. I didn't, I'm not much of a shopper, <laughs> and uh, uh, I was, I did, I did patronize uh, one or two bars that were on the Strip. And, um, three or four restaurants, so, um, yeah, I was around it, but I, I wasn't. The word regular is too strong a word to mm -hmm. describe that, my, my strip participation. And so at some point you become more personally acquainted with several of the people yeah. that are very active in, in producing the paper. How did that relationship develop? You said that you went to some editorial meetings. You became one of one of their uh, legal representatives. Did you introduce them to Al Horn? Um, no. If you can uh, just talk about some of those. No, Al had already made a name for himself among that crowd uh, by doing marijuana cases. And so that's probably how they uh, <clears throat> had become acquainted with Al. But yes, they were acquainted with, with Al as they were acquainted with me. They were acquainted with both of us. Mm -hmm. And you were acquainted with each other because he was a... A stalwart lawyer for the ACLU. Yes. So tell me a bit about... The, What you initially thought about the bird, what what the meetings were like, what well, you've already to, to start with that first part first. Uh, you were intrigued, Pitts. Now go to the rest of what you were about to say. Once you got to, who were the first? If you can recall, who were the first people that you met that were involved, and what was your your impression 
Well, as I've mentioned at this late date, I'm not real good at the timelines, but uh, Tom and Stephanie Coffin were certainly among those first people. Um, other people that I became closely acquainted with, such as Steve Wise, who brought me over here today, uh, were not, as I recall, I don't think they were founders. But Steve the, came a little, just a few months later. Yeah, a little later. That, that's my, that's my imperfect impression. Mm -hmm. So we're together on that. Yep. And um, one of the uh, people that was very early again, I can't totally say founder. Yeah. But looks like a founder to, from here. Mm -hmm. um, was uh, your. Uh, State Senator uh, Nan uh, Goodhero, it was then. She was married to Jean uh, Nan Grogan, that she works under now, which was her birth name. Or actually, Oruk. Her, her. Excuse me, Oruk, too. I uh, think she does yeah. Nan Grogan Oruk, or, but yeah. as the, yeah, the state um, senator. Yeah, yeah. Oruk came along a good bit later in mm -hmm. the process, mm -hmm. came into her life a good bit later. He had been in some other city. Yeah. Which one? I have no idea. And um, Becky Hamilton. All of these that I mentioned, I'm not totally saying they were founders, but they were close to the founding time. Yeah. Uh, there was, what was his name? I, I had it a few days ago. Oh, yeah. There was. A guy, Arthur Banks. Sometimes he was Arthur Banks. Sometimes he was Arthur Burghardt. And uh, he was, as far as I recall, uh, the only black guy in that crowd, black person in that crowd. Although there is another one that I've been in touch with lately, named Tim Hayes, yep. who said he was, who says he was part of that crowd, but I don't recall him from those days, but I've become acquainted with him somewhat more, more recently. Mm -hmm. and I've interviewed Tim. I, I think this is the first that I've heard mention of Arthur. There's been some discussion of Arthur on the Bird uh, email list, mm -hmm. and um, it didn't reveal his whereabouts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason it didn't reveal his whereabouts is because nobody knows. Right. Do you recall what Arthur, as one of the few black people involved with the bird, do you recall if he was writing or? They were all writing. Yeah. I don't recall anything specific that hardly any of them, that hardly any of them wrote. Yeah, yeah. Do you recall the the political or cultural perspective, a, a, a certain topic that that resonated most with you, or the <coughs> the most resonant one, I suppose, was around uh, free speech, but there were. Other many other topics that it covered. It was just kind of the waterfront for those days. Waterfronts get covered, right? Yes. Do you recall what the, or how would you characterize as best you? Excuse me. Uh, one reason uh, that, uh, one aspect of Free speech being a particularly interesting topic to me was I was doing a lot of free speech stuff unrelated to the bird for, for the ACLU office I was working for. Mm -hmm. So it was a good fit as far as them finding a lawyer. Yeah. And that work that you were I, I, I would call that a good fit in the sense uh, that we usually want. And the free speech work that you were doing professionally for the ACLU, 
was that around a, a very broad issue of, of free speech or particularly around um, well all of the uh, free speech issues uh, for the issue for the ACLU usually are around a specific they have their genesis in a specific issue right but was there a common and no particular common thread except that in those days uh, being literally unlike uh, the 70s which are not literally part of the 60s. Uh, all of those um, free speech issues, most of them, I should say, revolved around some politically relevant position that had been taken, either by the speakers or by the anti-speakers. And uh, you know, as well as anybody by now, that there are a lot of such issues bouncing around in the 60s. Yes. And uh, there still are, although they're substantially different. And litigating them is hugely different, a lot more complicated than it was then. Uh, I don't think the ACLU hires people right off the street and puts them to work handling cases like they did me. Possibly not, I'm not sure. But <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm still in close touch. I'm on the, uh, the board of the New Mexico affiliate. Mm. And as best you know, I'm not on the board. I'm one. I'm on the aggregation or something of uh, legal advisors, legal committee. Legal committee. That's the name of what I'm on. Okay. And what does that entail? It entails to going to a meeting once a week. I mean, once a month, and uh, hashing out whether we the cases at least these days, now that the affiliate there has expanded over the size it was when it started, I started, uh, the, um, that the staff brings to us, we've got a complaint on this, do we want to do anything about it? That's, I don't know, 80 or 90 percent of it, and I can't tell you what the other 10 or 20 percent is. Yeah. Yeah. And with the the early bird, or really the bird throughout. Excuse me. Uh, uh, just a little thing about how the ACLU operates. Uh, it needs to be um, more nimble than it sometimes is. Because I, what brought that to my mind was I said we we meet once a month. That's not very nimble, but. Um, we have ways of doing it nimbly to uh, something comes up and we can jump right on it without uh, having a monthly meeting mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and do it. Okay, now you can go on. Yeah, I was just going to ask it how you would characterize as best you had access, thought about um, public responses to the great speckled bird. Well, and public is huge. <laughs> like, yeah, what does what does that mean? But it, it, and you can parse it out. Uh, a there are a couple. There are a couple of areas it falls in. Uh, one is uh, the stuff that came to my attention, not solely, but as as one of the things that came came to my attention because of uh, the issues that were in those lawsuits we talked about yesterday. And the other thing is the more general um, acceptance or not of uh, what the bird was doing, or that that rag they put out. And uh, there's been what we would consider 
progress in both of those areas. And there's also been some regression, too. Mm -hmm. Somehow, this is all way off the topic, but it pisses me off regularly, somehow a very few, actually relatively few, ACLU, influential ACLU people have uh, gotten on board with that abomination referred to as, uh, under the First Amendment, as Citizens United. And um, I think the ACLU has shamed itself in support, in its few people who support Citizens United, in a similar way, but not as pervasive, as it shamed itself on the anti-communist stuff back in the older days. But I'm still there. I'm not going to let the shamers shame me out. Right, right. Can you talk a bit about um, what you recall of these editorial meetings or the general open open meetings that they had weekly to discuss content? Well, I've often thought about those meetings, but recently, more than recently, in the last good many years, I have, my thoughts haven't included much specific details that would answer that question. Um, they were sometimes Actually, not so much the ones I went to, which were not a lot, but they were not as contentious as some of the other ones that I simply heard about. Mm -hmm. But there were all sorts of little fissures opening here and here and here and over there all the time. And a lot of stuff was hashed out in meetings and uh, editorial conversations and editorial work, writing. Uh, so. Um, yeah, it was a real uh, classical um, laboratory of uh, things that worked out through free speech. What were some of those fissures that you recall? Oh, just on little issues like, uh, what are we going to emphasize, things like that. Um, and uh, some things which I do not, do not ask me which things, but some things uh, were um, um, disagreements over what political positions to take. Mm -hmm. Or it seemed political at the time. Do you recall any major flashpoints or of contention? Not very well. Uh, I think, I suppose uh, women's liberation was a flashpoint. And uh, although I was never attended a meeting where I could observe that, so it's maybe a questionable observation. What would you think of that, dude? Putting, putting that together, putting these two things together, issues of free speech and uh, criticisms um, arising out of women's liberation, in what is included in the bird. Yes, there, there was a lot of uh, flashing around putting those concepts together, the free speech and uh, women's issues. And uh, free speech had a big place in it, or at least uh, claims of free speech had a big, <coughs> had a big place in it. Like that would be one side of the argument of we should include advertisements or ads. There was ad controversies that I totally didn't participate in. Yeah. But yes, that's that's an example. Mm -hmm. But uh, language issues, such as don't call women chicks, mm -hmm. uh, 
that whole complex. There's a whole complex of issues around that that are confronted, not not just then, but in other contexts too. We tried to uh, have a session on that at, when we were organizing in Japan, and uh, the Marines, or at least the more vocal of them, weren't going to have it. No, there's nothing wrong with that. And that's what they are, as chicks. <laughs> there was a lot of that, and I think we gave up trying to push that complex of issues. At least with the bunch we had then, that was. Uh, Beyond our pale. Yeah. Hard as we tried. From your. Well, I guess, I guess the other question were you. So you were in Atlanta from January 1st, 68, and then in 70 or 71, you went to Japan for a year. Yeah, there I'm, a, I'm a little unclear on the exact year, but uh, I do feel pretty clear that I stayed with the ACLU for three years. And then you come and, back to And if you really leaned on me to press me, it might have only been two years. Fair enough. After Japan, do you come back to Atlanta? Yeah. And are here at least through 1976 when the bird ceases publication? Yeah. Okay, so having that established, can you talk at all about... Well, but approximately 76. I, I was not in the group or the conversational group discussing the demise. So I'm not really able to say I was here through that time. But um, Was there a point where you're participation or regular contact with with the bird well ceased or, I wouldn't say ceased just, but diminished yeah. yes and I can't name that point I mean it was a sort of a gradual thing the same same kind of process that uh, killed the thing in the first place mm -hmm. and speaking of killing it um, the opposition to it has uh, certainly perfected its techniques uh, to the point where um, it's amazing in retrospect that it lasted as long as it did. How would you characterize who or what that opposition was? The guys that run things. Maybe even a few women with those guys, but I, mm -hmm. the, uh, I generally you know, state that in the male gender. Yeah, yeah. Like the uh, colonel I was telling, the retired colonel with the Marine Corps I was telling you about, uh, didn't like interfering with his playground. Those guys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're still around. One of them got elected president. And has a, surrounded himself by a bunch of bunch of others of the same. Very much thought. the same, yeah. yeah. Maybe not. Maybe not saying quite as stupid things as he says. I'm unconvinced, with the help of a former Atlanta lawyer that I worked with on civil rights, a guy named Howard Moore, who's on the West Coast now. Uh, Howard uh, wrote a column or something. He wrote something I read that takes the position very recently that uh, we are selling those guys short but when we say he's stupid. Just the fact that he says stupid things doesn't mean he is really stupid and he's managed to get himself elected president, for example, um, made some money. Not, not the money he claimed he's made, but made some money. Um, uh, so. He can't be called as stupid as his uh, utterances would seem to make him. Mm -hmm. yeah. So from the... Excuse me. Yeah. Now that I didn't think 
that is an advancement. And now that I've mentioned Howard, Howard was uh, probably uh, the most prominent in working the SNCC legal problems. He was, seems to me in retrospect, he was the one that was SNCC's lawyer. He, um, the reason he's on the West Coast now is because he went out there to represent Angela Davis when she was charged with jailbreak stuff. Okay, so he had, had been in Atlanta and then went out. Yeah, he went out there to California. do that case and stayed. Yeah. And had you worked with him? Yeah, I worked with, with, with Howard a good bit. On what sorts of cases? Civil rights, or broadly defined, it includes some free speech, a lot of things, mm -hmm. and, you know, a lot of other issues. The lawyers bring a lot of other issues in. Yeah, I think Howard was an important person uh, from the things he did in that era. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to limit him to that era, but there's a lot of stuff that went on then that hasn't gone on since. So a lot of things I can confidently say come from that era mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or were happening in that era that are not happening now. Right. So with the years that you were around and, and most involved with the Great Speckled Bird, can you talk or, about how you observed it evolving, changing, the emphasis being being different, changes in just in the people over the I years? don't have I really don't have much to say about it evolving that I haven't already said in talking about it being a free speech laboratory. That was a very good big part of its evolution. It didn't always seem good at the time. How so? Uh, just a lot of personal conflicts, mm -hmm. some of which endure to this day. Yeah. Do you recall if you were, if you were a subscriber or? I don't recall that there was such a thing. Okay. The papers were bought either on the street or from street boxes. I guess that's on the street, isn't it? <laughs> uh, street sellers were important, especially in the early days. Mm -hmm. They didn't even have boxes for a long time. Right. And the boxes, and that's sort of one of the things that I was speaking to with, with my previous question about the sort of evolution and changes that they did develop different tactics and, and staff as people's lives changed, different people would come in. And, and time passed and uh, we had more Republican administrations and uh, less foundation money to do good works with. Mm -hmm. And the war in, in Vietnam was winding down. There were no more draftees who were pissed off about being drafted. Although the informal draft of uh, can't get a job, so I better join the army is still going on. Right. And during all those years. Excuse me, um, just to touch the base, I've mentioned the. <coughs> the National Lawyers Guild as being something I was relating to in a good many of those days. Uh, so I will mention that I am this day, still these days, on uh, it's the, the Guild's, uh, I'm on the steering committee for the Guild's task force on um, military law.
And what does that work entail? <coughs> In my case, not much. I'm really getting tired. Not sitting here, but I'm getting tired of uh, working on a lot of detailed work like lawyers do. Mm -hmm. And so I am not actively practicing law, and I'm not as active as I ought to be on that steering committee. I'll put it this way, I'm not as active as some of the others. But it's a resume topic. Yeah, absolutely. I guess a, a, a huge, uh, and to intentionally use, use, use the phrase, flashpoint of the, of the bird's history was its firebombing in 1972. Were you around yeah. at that time? Yeah, I was, yeah. Can you, can you talk about what your thoughts were about that at the, the time? How you all responded? I think my response was <clears throat> not much different from others who were not intimately involved like most of the rest of your interviewees. Um, yeah, I thought it was a great tragedy, but um, I, I didn't do much about it, but I did observe other people uh, that you've interviewed some of whom doing a hell of a lot about it and uh, getting the new place and uh, putting stuff back together and all that, but that was outside my field of uh, legal advisor and occasional meeting attender and friend. Mm -hmm. And during, during the years of the bird, at least in the initial years, 68 to 70, 71, you were living over on Penn Avenue, is that? Yeah, after I moved to there from Little Five Points area. Right. And then when you come back from Japan, where are you living? What neighborhood of Atlanta? About, kind of bounced around for a while. Um, and uh, at some point, and I don't, I can't pin this to the timeline exactly, but um, um, sometimes people, oh, I, here's, yeah, this is before I left, before I went, before I went to Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, I was um, temporarily without uh, regular housing uh, because I was uh, busy uh, in my spare time, so-called spare time breaking up, dealing with the breakup of my marriage. Mm -hmm. And uh, a few people, a few different people took me in for a little while during that. But my principal residence uh, then, I believe it was also before Japan. Yeah, it was before Japan. Uh, was uh, on, um, what's the street? It's a block east. It turns off of living in New Mexico. I find these words hard to mouth now. Ponce de Leon. Uh, uh, I forgot the name of the street. It's a, it's a small street. It's about a block, two blocks actually. The house was two blocks from uh, another hard word from me as a New Mexico now to say Manuel's Tavern. Okay. And uh, uh, one of the people that lived there, mother than me, was uh, one we mentioned, Steve Wise. And uh, one that I understand that uh, you're looking forward to interview, or somebody is looking forward to interview, Candy Hamilton. Mm -hmm. And um, Roger Friedman was there. You're, you've interviewed him. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's how the relationships and friendships and things endured through things other than putting out a newspaper. Was that a communal house or just just folks living together? I don't know. What's the difference? 
terminology probably and and whether whether there was an intentional politics of the way that the household was was run and then, you know there I've heard from several people that there were intentional living arrangements in places that had named heathen rage I remember that name <laughs> but, uh, so you're you I, 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 I was not one of those particular heathens <laughs> Uh, we didn't have a name, and uh, we didn't have anything particularly organized except cooking dinner. That was clearly rotated, and clearly and pre precisely rotated, mm -hmm. and the rest of it was, um, I've forgotten how we got the house cleaned, but we did somehow. <laughs> and uh, So, uh, probably to the extent that those two words are actually different, um, somewhere in between. Yeah. yeah. And did you did you stay there for a couple of years? Do you think? <clears throat> I think that's where I went to Japan from. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, it wasn't a couple of years. Yeah. And when how long it was, I don't know, but it wasn't that long. And when you came back, did you resettle around the same area that? Yeah. Sort of more or less. North Highland, Ponds. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm having trouble figuring out. Oh, actually, uh, I had a girlfriend then that I had had before I left, although not for a long time. And she and I didn't stay together very long, but uh, we moved together to a couple of those places in the area you just, excuse me, in the area you just described. Mm -hmm. And during during the years of of the birds' existence, late late sixties into the mid seventies, um, what were you doing for for fun? Um, hanging out, going to bars and dance halls. Did you have any favorites? Bars or dance halls? Well, it was a <coughs> it was a shifting category as the bars and dance halls themselves came and went. Uh, we did too. I, I, I wouldn't try to uh, give you a list of the ones I went to. A memorable name was, uh, memorable names, I think they were under the same ownership, were White Dot and Blue Lantern, and they, both of those hosted uh, traveling musical acts from time to time. Mm -hmm. Were they more up on, on Peachtree, as you recall it, or more down? They were both on Constitution. Okay. And other bars, other places, there's one in Little Five Points. I couldn't begin to give you the name of, uh, not Little Five Points, Virginia Island, mm -hmm. near that corner. Mm -hmm. Couldn't begin to give you the name of that. There were several restaurants in the area, things like that. Mm -hmm. Did you attend the, the big festivals in Piedmont Park? and? different political actions that the bird was helping organize and report on? In both cases, off and on. Occasionally, sometimes, often not. Um, the, uh, I was more consistent with the uh, Sunday afternoon music festivals in Piedmont Park than I was with uh, the various political actions. I did what I remember participating in. And, I don't know what ever came of it, but uh, there was a garbage strike. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the bird's projects was to encourage people, including its own um, staff. And I got some of that encouragement and acted on it, uh, was to go down and uh, apply for a job as a scab and then not uh, go back. <laughs> Were you often? 
if you remember, were you offered a position? No, I, I, nothing ever came. Nothing that I ever heard about came of those applications. Maybe, maybe some others heard more things than I did. Yeah. And I might be wrong in this, but I think I remember uh, as you were filling out your the biographical data sheet yesterday that you might have written something about a motorcycle shop or I don't recall doing much writing about it but I did work yeah that's what in your work history you wrote something about yeah yeah my work history includes uh, several months I think both before and after Japan uh, in a motorcycle shop was that something new for you or had you been I had riding my, in that I had relatively recently in life then taken up riding motorcycles but uh, and I was able to uh, get a letter sized paperback book uh, on how to fix a motorcycle and I read that and figured I had learned enough from that to do it now and I, I was right I had. And what was the, the shop called? Atlanta Custom Cycle. It was over on, um, just off of, um, I think it's Hunter Street. Okay. On the west side of there. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> with the exception of a guy who sell, uh, who's came by there practically every day just to hang out, but his occupation was selling uh, weekly payment life insurance. White guy. He, he was the only white guy involved around any of that, except one that I became very friendly with uh, and stayed in touch with for a long time. Just a, a boy from South Atlanta area. Okay. Whatever those, I don't remember the name of the three little suburbs together down down that way. Mm -hmm. Like East Point, Hapeville. Hapeville is one of them. I guess East Point's one of them. Forest Park. Or... Yeah, that's one too. Yeah. <laughs> so it was it was primarily a black run business for black motorcycle riders. Well, it was for everybody, but uh, but was that the most of the customers were, were, yeah. were black. Yeah. Okay. In fact, I, I could almost go so far as to say all of them were. Mm -hmm. And did you continue that riding motorcycles for many years? Did it become a big interest and yeah. hobby of yours? I, yeah, you could. I never have been much for applying the word hobby to anything I did, but uh, I, I believe it does apply. See, I'm, uh, I've had some problems in the last eight or ten or twelve months with my back, which is attributable to a dirt bike accident I had back then. Um, so I'm, I'm reminded. Mm -hmm. So you rode dirt bikes like off road? Mm -hmm. As well as street bikes? Yeah. yeah. Or for a while there to begin in, I used the same bike for both. Okay. Not a terribly practical arrangement. Did you have a, a make of motorcycle that you were per particularly keen on? Or? I was, no, not a make, but I, I was particularly keen on Japanese motorcycles. I never had much to do with uh, European or American ones. Mm -hmm. In fact, sometimes Japanese motorcycles were referred to as American because they were so ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I... 
my dad and uncle were probably around the same same generation as you. And a lot of pictures from the late 60s and 70s on Hondas and Kawasaki's. Mm -hmm. So yesterday you, you spoke about the about three lawsuits that the bird had that you were I called it three and uh, cautioned that it might really be two. Um, can you talk more broadly about the the legal issues that the bird faced over its years? I know that. Uh, Stephanie has talked about, and in the records of, of, of the paper, it shows like that that they faced lawsuits in in municipal, state, federal courts, ranging from obscenity, uh, I think the harassment of the, the street sellers. I don't know if it was on. Okay, excuse me. Um, obscenity reminds me that I may have left one of those cases out totally. I I did have. I said something about the obscenity uh, around the, 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 the around, shit, around the, around the shit, or actually around Julian Bond, ostensibly around the shit, but uh, I thought to truly about Julian. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'll give you a little aside here. Where I live now is uh, only a block or two, depending on how you measure it from the Rio Grande. And uh, when Julian died fairly recently, about a year or something, uh, he, uh, his family got the word out that uh, he wanted, I don't remember exactly how the request was phrased, but it involved flowers and water and so I walked down to the Rio Grande and picked some flowers on the way and put them on the water. It's a nice trip. So, with lawsuits against the bird, yeah. yeah back, back to that. Uh, I'm having some trouble separating things. Obviously, it's weird what fifty years will do to you. Yeah, <laughs> activity, and memory, mm -hmm. what you say you're doing, what you are doing. <laughs> and uh, in, anyway, um, yeah, I got a big um, bath of obscenity law, and somewhere along that that process. Yeah, and before, but never became a large fucking sub lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I'm not up on exactly what the the cases involved. I know that there's the iconic uh, motherfucker cover that uh, that they ended up in court over. I don't remember what happened with that one. I remember the the the, the phrase from the cover, yeah. uh, but I don't recall what was done in court with that, and I don't recall whether I was involved or not. Right. It may have been. Yeah. It may have been one of the smaller things that I did because some things, you know, they come up and you can get them dealt with pretty quick without doing much in court. Mm. But as I understand it, they, they, they faced lawsuits, whether the paper as an entity itself or whether individuals uh, arrested for involvement of distributing the paper or, um, but in municipal, state, federal courts around issues of obscenity, uh, students in, in high schools selling the paper and being expelled for possessing the paper, distributing it um, around issues of 
advertising for abortion services or birth control devices, street sellers being harassed, I don't know whether it was for vagrancy or distributing without a permit. There was a lot of that, none of which did I do much with. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm referring to the last thing you named out, street sellers' difficulties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that that also geographically was widely dispersed. Like, the, Folks in Savannah selling the paper and being harassed. The oh yeah, it happened all over the area where the paper went. And yeah, Savannah is included in that area, but I didn't have anything to do with the cases that were out of town. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there were anything major out of town. It was a big, big pain in the ass. Uh, I don't think that the bird was ever taken into federal court by the opposition. We filed cases in federal court against the opposition. Okay. That's where the federal connection, federal court connection comes in. Mm -hmm. That and the guy, that one of those was the guy that I told you about yesterday, that the judge uh, who enjoyed the uh, naked pictures mm -hmm. too much. Mm -hmm. And I think as the, as the Bird folks say, that they, throughout the, the Bird's existence, that there was really a never, time, never a time that they weren't in court for something and that they never lost a case. I have no idea. That and, uh, legend says. If, if that's true, then, um, and I kind of doubt it. <laughs> anyway, if that's true, it would have been the minor little things that I didn't ever get involved with to kept them in court, the uh, um, location of the boxes on the street corners and um, hassling the sellers and things like that uh, could have been simmering along in the municipal courts without any of my input. And as, I don't know whether as counsel to the bird, were you actively advising or were they actively seeking your input or was it more when the shit hit the fan, you'd step in and... Mostly it was a shit hitting the fan situation. There were a few asks, there were a few advices, but mainly shit. Mm. And in that one case we talked about litter and issue. Right. Do you recall what an issue might have been that they would have asked you beforehand? No, I don't. Yeah. I think it happened, but I, again, in the words of the radio host, I have no facts to back this up. Fifty years ago, to recall specific conversations is, uh, that's a challenge. Well, how do you feel about uh, taking a break for a little while, stretching legs, maybe refilling coffee? Yeah, let's do all that. Yeah. Well, we just had a little break and now our, our back rolling. And just finished uh, really talking about the Great Speckled Bird, was there anything further about the bird that you wanted to mention? Probably. Why don't, uh, before I, well, I don't have an answer right now, mm -hmm. but uh, at, at some point I'll go through these notes and see if there's anything okay. that I want to mention, including that. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've talked about your sort of Intermission is not the right word, but the the year that you spent in Japan that sort of bisects your, your years in Atlanta. And so when you come back from Japan, we also talked about you working at the, the motorcycle shop. Um, and then at some point... I was pretty well committed by that time to not being a lawyer anymore. Oh, okay. That, that commitment didn't last, though. So, yeah. The, the way, what do you want me You want to hear that, how that ended? Yeah, and also just what your feelings were 
driving you to feel strongly that you weren't going to be a lawyer anymore. Okay, uh, on that last thing, I, while I was in Japan, I had what seemed at the time to, to me to be an epiphany on that subject. And that particular version of the epiphany came when I was doing a fairly routine motion for a case. And uh, I just could not keep my mind on it or could not keep my body writing it and all that. I could just burn out on that shit. Uh, now, moving to the end of, of that attitude, uh, while I was working at, at the motorcycle shop after Japan, uh, Al Horn asked me to join him in starting a law office. And for some reason I can't uh, really dredge up or reproduce right now, I said yes. And the rest is the law projects and all that. And can you talk a bit about the the law project you mentioned yesterday, sort of a bit of how it tried to establish a law practice along a different structure, and yeah. then talk about non -traditional. the work that you guys engaged in. Non-traditional would be a good word, to, a good summary of those parts of the description. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, so can you describe how it was non-traditional and how well, much you and Al collaborated in coming up with this structure? One way in which it was non-traditional, at least in my experience, is uh, something that affected me negatively for most of the rest of my professional life, was we didn't charge enough. We tried to keep our fees low and affordable. And in keeping with an analysis of it that said uh, this work is not hard enough to be worth a whole lot of money. Uh, another way was uh, we tried to involve the non-lawyers in the law process as much as possible. Uh, that was not a success except as a way of, except as Uh, maintaining the letterhead and uh, little things like that. Uh, we did have a meeting. And when you say maintaining the letterhead, including the non-lawyers yeah. on the letterhead yeah. as yeah. named individuals. Yeah, I'm not, I don't exactly remember how we solved that problem or if we did, but yes. That was, and that was in, the, in our attitude anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, we, when we would have staff meetings, which was every week, I believe, uh, we would um, resolutely include the non-lawyers in those meetings and in the decision making. Um, and in terms of salaries, did you all try to? We, we, we tried to make it uh, all the same uh, with some variations based on people's individual circumstances. Mm -hmm. For example, Al not only had the individual circumstance of being uh, the most capable and experienced lawyer among us, he also uh, had uh, some uh, child support payments he needed to be making, so he would not even have made those payments if uh, he had gotten the same salary as the rest of us did. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what else is. That's all the examples that come to mind right now. And what was the bulk of your casework uh, type of clients that you were serving? Well, in my in my case, uh, 
the bulk of it was um, criminal cases. And to probably generalize that to the whole office. Um, here's one thing, it was another fee-related, non-traditional thing is uh, we set a flat fee lower than we heard of anywhere else for uncontested divorces and actually advertised that. Was that successful? Did you end up? Did that end up being a, a large part of the practice? No, but it, it, it did persist. I mean, we did maintain that fee structure for the, for divorces. But actually, we didn't do much divorce work beyond the uncontested ones. We set that easy fee for. Right. And when you say criminal cases were largely the sort of casework that you were doing. Would that run the gamut of all sorts of defending people facing crime, or what sort of crimes? Well, um, we didn't we, we didn't really do the full gamut because two reasons. One is uh, the whole gamut didn't come to us, and uh, the other. Uh, or everyday difference was there were certain kinds of cases that we wouldn't take, generally uh, having to do with men mis mistreating women, and we didn't defend any uh, civil rights type uh, cases. We only initiated them and pursued them uh, against the malefactors, not, mm -hmm. not representing the malefactors. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know what else to add to that. You had mentioned that Al sort of gained a reputation, at least amongst the the counterculture political left, and certainly on the strip, a place you asked about, right, for uh, representing people on that are being were being charged with marijuana violations. Did that continue to be? Uh, yeah, large that, part of the practice. That continued, right. As well as robbery, theft, uh, is, is that part yeah. of criminal law? Yeah, uh, not a lot of it, but some. I uh, had a, a, a theft case um, where um, uh, some, some black guys were, uh, this becomes relevant, the race becomes relevant. Uh, were charged with stealing some automotive supply stuff or tires or something, I don't know exactly. And uh, as with most criminal cases, both within and without our uh, practice, uh, ended in connection with uh, settlement talks, please. And, um, a lot of people accused in that case of stealing that stuff or those tires or whatever it was. And uh, all the lawyers were called into uh, the judge's office to uh, discuss settlement. And um, somebody made a, re made a point that I don't precisely remember but the judge's reaction, I do precisely remember, was, yes, the nigger will steal. And this is in the 1970s. Yeah. And many years later, um, one of the um, lawyers that had worked with us, that had been in our office, rather, that are part of our office, and, definitely worked with, uh, got in trouble. I don't remember for sure whether it was him that was in trouble or he was representing somebody that was in trouble for having used the word nigger in the sense of quoting somebody. And um, I tried to make sure that uh, they knew that the, uh, 
look for an opportunity to work that story out what the judge said to do it. to that. Any holes I can fill? Uh, as best as you can recall, can you say what years the law project existed? <coughs> well, we started, I think it was in the fall of the year I got back from Japan. Um, Maybe you can figure what year that was. <laughs> we'll say maybe 72. And uh, it lasted, well, I left, I'll, I'll say, uh, in, um, in time to get to New Mexico and go to work in, uh, I think it was 19, 1981 or something like that. Some often around about a decade. That's what I just said, and yeah. it doesn't seem like it was that much to me, but that's uh, where my time is stuck right now. And as we were wrapping up, and uh, after we had wrapped up yesterday, when we were leaving the library here, we happened to run into Roger Friedman, yeah. one of the people that, right there. Yeah, right outside this room. Uh, one of the people who had worked on the bird and also worked on the law project. Right. And, and I haven't mentioned that, but yes, that, that's exactly and right. And Stephanie Coffin was another mm -hmm. um, that was involved in both. Uh, but Roger was talking about um, a trip that he had remembered the two of you being on together you said, I don't remember that. But he was talking about the, the, the point of this trip um, was that he was doing research on jury roles or jury pools. Yeah, we, we, we um, did a fair amount of, uh, we raised that issue a fair number of times. Yeah, so can you talk about sort of that, what that component of the practice and... Well, that was a natural follow-on to... Uh, some of the stuff I had been, been doing, some of the law I had been doing that involved uh, jury challenges. Um, I mentioned yesterday that Operation Southern Justice situation, which was, which we thought was desegregating the jury roles. And uh, as I said yesterday, <laughs> it didn't do as much as orders we got said it should do. Uh, so um, the jury challenges, challenges to the composition of the jury uh, was a uh, recurring theme throughout the criminal law that I had done and did do with the law project. And Roger had some background in uh, I almost said statistics, but I don't know if it was that st sophisticated, but... Uh, mathematics. Mathematics, it, it was clearly in. And so, he was good to have to <coughs> work through the arithmetic of our jury challenges mm -hmm. and compare them with the population and that, all that kind of stuff. And he was saying that he recalled that this specific instance was was in Virginia, which leads me to ask: Was the casework that you were doing throughout the South, throughout the country, or primarily Atlanta, Georgia based, with a little bit of here and there? Pr primarily the latter. Um, you asked me a question yesterday that uh, prompted me to name the states I had worked in, mm -hmm. and I don't think I had or had not worked in, and uh, 
if I had thought of it, I would have said Virginia would be one of those states that I didn't do any work in. Mm. Which might be true, and Roger somehow was, was somewhere else or misremembered. Or, yeah. But in any case, the, the scope of your work was not just Atlanta-based, Atlanta clients. Right, but it uh, focused more and more on Atlanta as you know, us being just here in Atlanta. It was different from the ACLU Southwide experience. Mm -hmm. And so we were, I don't know, focused on Atlanta, I wouldn't say as much as I would say focused on Georgia. One thing I haven't mentioned that fits that part of the conversation uh, was uh, the uh, prison cases. And uh, there had been a, there had been some prison disturbances and there was litigation about those disturbances and some of that litigation, probably the bulk of it, uh, was defended by us, by the Law Project, and for some fairly brief period of time there. But it, it, it involved a lot of trips to uh, southeast Georgia, centered around Reedsville, Val, not Valdosta, but uh, Vidalia, and um, other places in that general area that had prisons. And, oh, and, and, and Alabama, a good bit, southern Alabama. And uh, that led to my uh, being consulted, I would say, a couple of times, several times, by lawyers in New Mexico about prison cases because they had a humdinger of one out there, bigger than most anywhere else in the country, of people injured and damage done for a prison disturbance, by a prison disturbance. and. Um, which in turn led partially to my moving to New Mexico, not because I wanted those cases, but because I liked the place mm -hmm. and had felt some need for getting out of Atlanta before I got too tied down, like I kind of mentioned yesterday, I think offline. Yeah. And the, with these, these prison cases, what was the the crux of the argument or the didn't do it <laughs> he didn't do it people prisoners being charged for inciting well, riots or or uh, to carry it to the extreme that it got carried to uh, killing a guard And you had a lot of these cases. We worked a lot on the cases that came out of Reedsville and a couple of places in southern Alabama. Uh, Atmore and Holman were the, they may have been a third place, I'm not sure, but anyway, the towns in southern Alabama that had prisons included the town of Atmore and the town of Holman. And there had been disturbances in the prisons in both those towns, and we did the cases. It was a lot easier in those days to uh, move uh, in a way that you really, that you didn't get in trouble to move from uh, town, move from place to place outside your uh, licensed jurisdiction. Mm. And how, if at all, we, uh, for all those in Alabama, we did have somebody on the list of those of us who were in the cases who had, a, had an Alabama license. And how, if at all, would you be compensated for, for the work in such cases? We wouldn't. That was a uh, part of the non-traditional stuff. Mm -hmm. we, we were able to get a person who, in my opinion, was a famous lawyer to handle one of the cases. It was a guy that died a couple of years ago, Lynn Wineglass, who's a 
did. He's super good. So he, uh, he got interested. We interested him in doing one of the cases, and he did. He, he did a good job, I think. I didn't see it, but um, I don't. I can't remember now how it came out, <laughs> but. Uh, Anyway, so we, so we got some national exposure on things like that. Working, participating when wine glass worked was a treat. What was the outcome in, if you can generalize, for most of these sort of cases? The ones we had, the outcome was uh, overall highly favorable. Not in terms of verdicts, but in terms of uh, backing the prosecution down so that they didn't uh, care to continue doing all those cases. And uh, a fair number, a fair proportion, it wasn't a large number, fair proportion of them were uh, just dismissed by the prosecution. And one of them resulted, though, in a life sentence. So it wasn't uniformly yeah. good or successful from our standpoint. Who knows what good is? Right. I'm about to turn possibly away from the law project, unless unless you had some some other things to add on that. Um, not that I'm thinking of right now. And we can come back. It, it, we may get back. You know, get. I wanted to move us to yesterday, and I, I don't know whether it was while we were recording or not, but you had mentioned that um, that you had worked a case, uh, a case of, uh, around the issue of abortion pre the Ro Roe v. Wade decision. Yeah, in effect, it was the Roe v. Wade case, although it was under a different title when I was working on it. Okay, okay. If you could talk about that some. Well, I didn't have a big role in that, but my name is on the pleadings. And I think maybe, no, one time, what I'm saying here is, I can't remember what case it was, but one time I, the ACLU flew when I was in, I think it was, I was in private practice. ACLU flew me to New York to consult with an ACLU lawyer uh, on something going on in the Supreme Court. And, could have been that, but I don't think so because my role wasn't that big that time. But anyway, uh, the, the name of that lawyer that I went to uh, New York to consult with, uh, ACLU, ACLU staff lawyer at that time, she was, it was uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And that's better a good part of an afternoon talking to her about about that. Don't remember anything we said. Do you recall what the the legal perspective or grounding would have been of why you would be called in? Like is this a, a privacy issue, a, a free speech issue, a a health issue? No, like, no, but, but I, I do uh, know that um, the, I'm pretty sure that I had had the case from the bottom up. So I, it wasn't just, I, I don't know if I had the case, but at least I had been involved from, in the lower courts as well. And what year do you think this might have been? I don't know. Like the early 70s? And Probably, you, yeah. And you said that you were in private practice at the time. I did say that, and then I kind of wondered if I, is that, was that really during the private practice time? Uh, yeah, it, it had to be, yeah. 
it had to be what I was pretty sure I was, it was what I was with the law project. Oh, okay, so that's what you were referring to as private practice, the law project. Yeah. Okay. So a little feather in your cap, uh, historically, to that yeah. you, you had been involved in this and, and one would have consulted Ruth Bader Ginsburg. That by now it had become a feather rather than a piece of shit in the public eye. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll have to go look that up sometime and see, see your name. Back to the ACLU for a minute, if, we, if we're... Yeah, like in, unless you have some more to... to if, we're talking, yeah, if we're talking about uh, significant cases or cases that significantly eroded our uh, time commitments, took a lot of work, I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, does the name Howard Levy mean anything to you? It sounds like a, a like a name of historical importance that I've encountered before, but I can't. Howard uh, was, I think still is, I haven't been in touch with him in a long time, uh, a doctor who was presumably, I don't know, somehow drafted or somehow got into the army and um, was uh, stationed at Fort Jackson. And uh, he said some things that the army didn't like about Vietnam and stuff, cutting edge political stuff for them. And, um, he got prosecuted, and uh, the ACLU, through the efforts of Chuck Morgan, uh, represented him, at least. Uh, pretty much another one where I could use the word at least, and it wasn't you know, more appropriately, it was Muhammad Ali, but you have heard him. And, uh, anyway, um, that case went in and out. The trial had already happened when I went to work for the ACLU. It was, had just concluded. And um, when I left the ACLU, there were still matters in courts pending. And in fact, the case went on one of its trips to the Supreme Court after I left. So uh, it was a big time sink. And um, that had the effect on me of uh, teaching me a lot of military law and procedure, which probably accounts for some of the military things that we've discussed. Mm -hmm. One could talk about the Levy case forever, but I don't really have any quick summaries to give you now beyond what I've just said. It was in a lot of courts, civil, civilian and military. And, and how did it turn out? In um, it made some bad law in the military courts, that's one result, except that uh, this guy I was telling you about yesterday, Mikey Weinstein, um, has figured out a way to use it constructively on things to get toward results that we like. Um, I don't know exactly, I, I don't remember now exactly what the advantage uh, Mikey got from it is, but it has something to do with uh, some things that, that the military doesn't have any business messing with. But they messed with Howard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so th there is that one. I don't know much more to 
to say about it unless you have some curiosity about it. But his charges weren't weren't ultimately dismissed, or right? You, you, yeah, uh, he did some time in a military prison, uh, but uh, for speaking speaking out for, against for the military policy. One of our favorite, especially Chuck's uh, favorite offenses, was described as uh, promoting disaffection. What the hell is disaffection mean to say all the time? And, you know, he said that the, uh, the, mil the American military was committing war crimes in Vietnam and anything. You can take it from there, a number of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, was, it was not ultimately all dismissed, but um, some, something happened during its process. And I was gone by the time that something came to fruition, but that something was that uh, some influential military person uh, guaranteed that uh, they would make sure that Howard didn't do any more time. He'd already done some, so it's, it's short of total victory, but it, it did keep him from kind of finishing up the sentence. Mm -hmm. While we're talking about things military, all of its military. Uh, I'll return to Japan for a minute and uh, mention that um, those coffee houses I was referred to, uh, that enterprise went uh, also overseas. In, uh, in particular, it came to Iwakuni, Japan, where they established a coffee house named The Hobbit, a book I still haven't read, and it was promptly, before I got involved, uh, put off limits, and, um, but it was, it remained a, a sort of an organizing center, and, uh, Marines kept coming there, and uh, none of them got in trouble for it, although, again, before I got involved, one had gotten in trouble for it, uh, for going to an off-limits place. And, um, but that never happened again. And that case was handled, the off-limits prosecution was handled once it got out of away from the marine base and back toward uh, where all shit comes from, Washington. But I'm sounding like one of those uh, right-wingers now. Uh, we've, we, we've got a political candidate in New Mexico that's running solely against Washington. Uh, the, um, anyway, the Washington aspect of the case, that is the appeals, uh, was handled by a law firm in Washington, so and that transition had already occurred before I got there, so I don't know a whole, whole lot about it except we lost. The uh, military appellate courts declined to interfere with the off-limits declaration. And uh, so I don't have anything more to add to that chapter, except that uh, spending a year in Japan, living in a, in a coffee house, was quite an experience. My bedroom was in the coffee house. Really? Yeah. Upstairs. And did your daughter have a bedroom up there too? No, 
she had a bedroom in another house that the project maintained. Okay. That is quite different. <laughs> Moving completely other side of the world, living in a GI coffee house. Yeah, and every now and then uh, there would be some reason why I would need to go to uh, something that was occurring in the Tokyo area. And that was uh, pretty much an all day ride on the train. And um, the bullet train track had not been completed all the way from Yokoni to uh, Tokyo at that point. But uh, so. Uh, some of the trip was on the old-fashioned trains, and some was on that new thing. Mm. <coughs> and did Robin just sort of hang out and make her make her own adventure? Yeah. Sounds like an an interesting, potentially really formative experience for a teenager. Yeah, formed her into a right winger. <laughs> it's a crack shoot. Yeah. And so you stayed with the law project until roughly 1981. Yeah. And 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 then you you left. Did the project continue on? Did Al keep it going with, did he bring in? Initially, yes. Ultimately, no. Uh, he this transitioned from initial to ultimate. Uh, he caught cancer and died. Right. Not too many years after. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> I wasn't around for that, but uh, from halfway across the country, it does seem that without him, or perhaps without the two of us, it was no longer viable. But he, he remained with the project yes. until his death? Yes. Or until his the illness. Yeah, until the bedridden part of his illness. And so tell me about New Mexico. You went out there. Did you continue I, on with law? Yeah. I went uh, at some point during the um, during my time here. I went to uh, a seminar, lawyer seminar, and met a lawyer for the first time, a particular lawyer. Her name was, is Nancy Hollander. Uh, and told her, I was on the program actually, and I told her that uh, I was uh, I, thinking about moving to New Mexico. Does she know of any jobs? She said, yeah. Uh, Ray Tug is leaving the public defender's office. No, that place is opening up. So. I, went out there and interviewed those guys, including the, the chief public defender, or, or yeah, that guy, <laughs> the chief public defender, and was offered the job and took it. So I was able to make that transition without a period of unemployment. And did you move to, right to Albuquerque? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, again, two or three years. Um, the, the head public defender wanted some, some commitment from me to do more than the minimum. I figured that meant more than a year. And so I did do, I don't remember whether it was two or three years, but I did it. I did more than, more than the minimum and then I left that and just opened my own office, of, which is more or less the main place I was, I was, have been practicing law. When I've been practicing law, it's been out of that office more or less ever since. And what sort of law has that been focused on? 
Wasn't much focus. Um, I would, um, there was a period there, a major period there, where I was <clears throat> taking damn near anything that would come in the door, except for the guy who asked me to, came to my house, he lived in my neighborhood, came to my house, and asked me to represent him and said he had a fee. Now that's two things that usually don't come together. He wanted you to pay him a fee to take No, him. no, he, he wanted to pay me a fee to take his case, represent him on this thing, and I turned him down even though I needed the money uh, because it fell into one of those categories we didn't do at the law project, that is men beating up women. Mm -hmm. Or at least the woman that they, their so-called girlfriend or wife or whatever the relation was. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I did that. Had some successes, some failures, various things. Tried a case in Santa Fe down near all summer. Gold mine fraud. Gold mine fraud. I thought that. From where I'm sitting and all the, the law that you've talked about, Thus far, that's very different. I guess in, in your early days you were doing business law. Maybe that's yeah. That, that, you, could, you could pick up. And, yeah, uh -huh. I understood understood business to mm -hmm. some extent anyway. And you you said that from the point of opening your own practice. You used the phrase something along the lines of, when I was practicing law, it was out of that office. So were there other things that you were doing sort of interstitially to earn a living? Not. Or supplement your living? Not really in the, no, not, not in that sense. Uh, um, I'm, not why, I'm not sure why I said when I was practicing law, I might have just been thinking about the fact that I'm not anymore. Mm -hmm. And how long ago? And I was all, probably also thinking about the fact that there were other things in my life than making a living. Mm -hmm. First follow up: About how long ago was it that you that you stopped practicing? That petered out over some period of time that I can't quite specify, but it uh, reached its climax about a year ago. Uh, when I surrendered my law license, I uh, wouldn't have to pay the bar dues anymore. Which by that time had become pretty substantial. Mm -hmm. and that's another. The state bar, especially the compulsory ones like New Mexico had, uh, are a major boondock. And they're taking a lot of money and spend it on stuff we don't need. Is it thousands of dollars a year to remain active? Uh, if you do everything they want you to, or that they require, and are uh, careful about what you accept, getting additional education is the, is one of the big expenses. And if you're careful about all that, you can probably, you can come in under a thousand. But but easy to go over as well. Yeah. The other follow-up is, uh, you just said there were a lot of other things in your life besides practicing law and working. We've already talked about them, motorcycles, bars, you know, just general life, that's all, uh, girlfriends, whatever. I didn't get to, on the girlfriend front, I didn't get that to, uh, I didn't get that completed until I met and married my present wife. And I do like the idea that, uh, it does impress me sometimes, she impresses me, not only with her intelligence that I referred to yesterday, but when the machine was off, <laughs> a little more when it was on, 
And uh, don't remember whether I mentioned um, one measure of the intelligence is that she had been a difficult student as a child and so was not allowed to um, get as much education as the other members of her, other, as her brothers and sisters did. Uh, they had an arrangement down there. She, she lived in um, a town named Palomas, Las Palomas, uh, just south, immediately south, a foot south, if that much, of the border between New Mexico and Chihuahua. And um, she, um, they had an arrangement. Uh, the the border, the American side of the border, had a town on it, a bit north of it, a few miles, uh, named um, um, Denning, which had one of the most intriguing named newspapers in the country, the Deming Headlight. <laughs> and, uh, Anyway, uh, they had an arrangement with the um, school system on the American side of the board, well, Deming on, on the American side. The, the two sides had a mutual arrangement which uh, allowed children in, in Palomas to go to school in the Deming school system. That's long gone now, but it was still in operation when she and I met back in the 90s, I guess, and um, but she didn't get the benefit of, of it because she was difficult, and uh, she was also uh, her birth gave her mother some diff some difficulty, as often happens with childbirth, and uh, the. Um, um, so her mother, having this difficulty with the birth, came across the border, which was easy to do then, uh, to Deming to the, go to the hospital where she was born. You know what that means? She's an American citizen. Yeah. They, they, they went, went right back to Deming as soon as she was born. But she is a, she now has dual citizenship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure they corrected that oversight? I'm not sure they have corrected that part. They certainly, as I mentioned, corrected the part where uh, the kids could go to school in Deming. Well, they're trying. I think, I think that they would refer to, to children such as, such as Susanna as anchor babies. They do. And it's not true. It's not an accurate metaphor. No. Didn't anchor her family at all. <laughs> and, Few million others, few, few hundred thousand, shall we say? <coughs> and what what is Susanna's full name? Uh, Susanna Salazar. And um, I do like the idea of living in New Mexico, not only with a Mexican wife but being able to vote for a politician whose first name is Xochitl. Which I thought I recognized from a, some Mexican cultural history that I had read, but I thought I probably didn't. But anyway, this is a good Xochitl. Uh, some of the uh, uh, descriptions of her namesake are not so good because it pictures so Cheadle as the um, namesake of, um, was it Cortez? One of those guys, uh, Aztec mistress, who was Cortez or whichever one it was, I'm not sure I got the right one, uh, girlfriend, and I think maybe even had a baby with him. And uh, so she was basically the snitch in that version. In another version, she was doing all that with them so she could get them all drunk and have them killed by the Aztec army. Or well, maybe it wasn't, wasn't, probably wasn't Aztec in that part of Mexico. But anyway, they, 
the, the native army. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, anyway, so Chilu so has a really decent chance of uh, beating. She's running for Congress. Is it Congress? No, it's some other office. In a Republican district. She has a reasonably good chance of winning. And she's a spirited young woman who has a lot of good ideas for doing good things that we would like. Mm -hmm. New Mexico is often an exception to the bad shit, the tight, tight ass shit that we read about uh, the politics in various states. And uh, New Mexico doesn't usually appear in those articles. Next door, Arizona does. <laughs> yeah. Yes. New Mexico and Arizona became states in 1912. And it was a fairly long process uh, in both states, I guess. In New Mexico, the um, well, the first proposal was to treat the two, the present two states, as one and admit that one to the union altogether. And uh, not long after I arrived in New Mexico, I read a book about the state. They had a, that that did not pass. It, it had to be submitted to a vote in both states, and uh, it passed handily in New Mexico, but it didn't pass in Arizona. They didn't want to be lumped in with all those Mexicans. So that's not a new thing. Interesting. We have wandered somewhat afield, and uh, here are my here's my air, airline information, and uh, well, this is too far afield. Have you seen the um, TV series that's current now, named Ozark? I'm, the camera cannot see that I'm smiling and laughing because as you were coming up with the name, I, uh, in my head, I was like, he's going to say Ozark. How, did, how did, that, did that land in your head? I don't, I don't know, telepathy or something. Uh, no, I have not seen it, but the re I think one of the reasons it came to me is because it's been mentioned and recommended to me by several people who... I respect politically. It, it, its premise, I guess I told you, is that um, uh, rednecks from the middle part of this country are just as mean, evil, and vicious as uh, the Mexican drug cartels. And uh, it also presents the FBI in a bad light, which I thought was illegal on television. And it even has some waterboarding done by the FBI. Mm -hmm. I think it's by the FBI. Done by somebody who is not usually publicized for doing waterboarding. Right. Um, not too long after I got I stopped being in the in the um, public defender's office in Albuquerque. I was coming out of uh, a suburban courthouse and uh, saw a black guy out front sweeping the sidewalk. And I just had to stop. I was just going to say, you're the first black guy I've seen sweeping the sidewalk since I left Georgia. <laughs> and we went and had lunch together. And he had done a disc jockey and had had some interaction with Sly and the Family Stone, which I think he said uh, 
uh, culminated in his being propositioned to, to uh, have sex with Sly. And uh, that's about the end of that story. <laughs> An interesting encounter. Yeah. For him and for you. <laughs> Did he tell you what the outcome of that was? He turned it down. Oh, so he said. But kept the story. Yeah, yeah. He met the guy. Yeah, that, yeah it, it did go that far. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and what was your... What was your experience working in the public defender's office? Did that give you any new perspectives on on the law? Probably. I've never done any substantial project related to the law that didn't give me some kind of new perspective. And, uh, you know, I was with it for two or three years. And uh, I didn't get to liking uh, the denizens of the U.S. Attorney's Office any more than I had. I've about run out of uh, ability to summarize perspectives by now. Here, here at two thirty. Fair enough. Fair enough. I just, I just, I just felt that I should ask again, uh, since we the, um, glossed over that pretty quickly. One piece of the perspective I got was coming down at that point at the uh, uh, U.S. Attorney's Office and the Public Defender's Office, Federal Public Defender's Office were. Um, near top separate floors of the federal building and so we shared a lot of elevator time and I had really pissed off one of the um, uh, prosecutors in that office by telling the judge he promised so and so and he said I did not so he invited me out he, he, he compared me uh, to uh, a piece of shit stuck on the sole of your shoe and invited me outside to fight. And that, and that meaning sort of like something that lingers that you just can't get rid of? I guess, or a piece of shit you can't get rid of. Yeah. <laughs> and he invited you out to do a physical... Yeah, and I've forgotten, I've forgotten how it, it was uh, we just de-escalated that by the time the elevator got to the first floor, but somehow we did, and we didn't go outside and fight. So, but anyway, that didn't improve my attitude toward uh, U.S. attorneys, assistant U.S. attorneys. And so, the years that you're, and I, I think I missed this, the specificity of it earlier, so you were a public defender for the federal government? Yes in the early 1980s? Yes. Early, 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 early to middle, yeah. Um, what was the tenor, morale, feeling of the office at that, that time politically? Well, Despite the shortness of the time, there was some, uh, a substantial amount of turnover in that office. It had, during most of that time, maybe all of it, uh, three lawyers. It's got a whole lot more now. It's got dozens, I think. And um, the, uh, because of the turnover, uh, there's no short answers to that question. Right. Uh, but it speaks to something. Some of the lawyers were highly capable people. Others didn't work out all that well. But that's not a political thing except in personnel terms, hiring terms. Or, it's political, but it's not as directly political as you were asking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, the head person who took over a month or so after I got there. After I'd gotten hired by one head person, 
he left and left me to the new head person <laughs> who uh, she had a reputation for being kind of prickly. And the reason she had that reputation was because it was true. <laughs> anyway, we have gotten along fine ever since, except I haven't seen her recently. But anyway, we, we maintained a relationship for a long time and uh, got along just fine. Again, I had had all I could take. Well, we've covered a lot of ground. Do you have anything further in your notes, or? I think I winnowed it all out as we sat here. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah. So, in the, moving towards towards wrapping up, I'll, I'll ask uh, from the standpoint now of forty, in, in many cases, fifty years after the fact. How do you reflect? reflect on and feel about um, that period of the late 60s and 70s, the, the time of the bird, the, the work, the friendships, just that moment in your life, having lived through that. Oh, I reflect on it all the time. And how so? When the way I've described you. I don't have much more to say about that. Uh, what needs amplification, you think? Yeah, just sort of like how you feel about that, that period of your life. Is it a, is it a high point? Is it, uh, is it just I would everything? Call it. You, you, yesterday you were using the term of um, sort of accumulative, Accretion. It's all accumulative accretion. Uh, I would call it because of so many things that happened. There are a number of high points, but put it, mash it all together, and we would just call it a big point. I mean, there's a big change of scenery, change of uh, domestic life, change of a lot of things I mentioned. Uh, how smart my wife is, uh, I don't think I got to the part which I got too off to take. I think yesterday that uh, because of the reasons I gave about her difficulty with schooling, she didn't uh, um, get much education uh, when she lived in Mexico. And as a result of not having got much education there, she didn't get much education when she <laughs> came to this country as a teenager. Uh, but she learned English, which, as I said, unlike uh, the rest of her many brothers and sisters, uh, she, um, she learned English then uh, as a, as a grown-up. Right. And uh, really, really fluently. Fluently and without hardly any accent. And the without an accent is rare in my observation around Mexicans in New Mexico, which is substantial. So, Her brothers and sisters don't have much accent either, so they all smart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, they uh, are excused for doing better because they uh, they got more schooling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether it was on or off the tape or maybe just only in my head yesterday that um, I met her through my friendship with her brother, who is also for his part. He's done work with the uh, substantial amount of work with the Sabatistas. And uh, I don't know what else to 
say about nachos. There's many other things. I don't know how to pick one right now. So clearly, you came here to Atlanta to to spend all these hours with me talking about time and, and I didn't even know you. No. Nope. Now, now I know you quite well, <laughs> or at least aspects that you you. Uh, graciously shared um, but you're here and you're uh, staying with Tom and Stephanie Coffin um, so clearly there is an enduring friendship there have you maintained relationships with many other people from from the years of the bird into the present somewhat but not greatly mm -hmm. uh, not as much as Tom and Stephanie but um, some of the relationships have significant features to them. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not the right terminology for that. Some of, but there's more to them than, oh, that's somebody I knew a long time ago and I speak to every two years now. Right, right. And as so often happens, as, as we've been talking about the past, points of reference. Excuse me, to complete that answer a little bit, uh, Stephanie, I'm sure, I think I heard this, has told you that uh, she and Tom are having a little function Sunday afternoon. Correct. Okay, we'll come. That's all I'm saying. Okay. I will, I will be there. Okay. Um, yeah, in the course of the interview and in, in talking about the points, the past, we've periodically made, made reference to the present and sort of comparisons and connections. Um, which leads me to ask, how do, you, how do you see the world today and what are, where are the centers of your interest, passion, concern, energy? Oh, I see the world today as a big fucking mess, um, some of which, not anywhere near all of which, is attributable to, our, to whatever in this world, in this country, happened to uh, give us the present president and whatever happened in Hungary and Poland and a couple other places to give the world to the strong men in those countries and whatever is happening in Brazil uh, to get rid of uh, one of the great leaders of this century and uh, substitute uh, some right-wing hack for him and her. Uh, I said one. There are at least two. Lula and um, what's her name? Um, uh, Jilma Rousseff. Rose, Rose, yeah. And um, my worldview now is taken a nosedive in terms of favorability. The uh, things I'm talking about, like whatever they did to bring about those things, what they did tells me that a fear I had way back in the 60s that the guys who run things are going to figure us out and know how to combat us, and uh, if we tell them, it, since we, since to operate the way we operate, it's necessary to lay out what we're doing, uh, they're just going to use that against us and figure out how to uh, blunt it, and they have certainly blunted it. Feels that way. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought for a long time that I had been wrong about that. <laughs> no, I was right all along. And does, <coughs> does that make you, and actually this is not a, an either or,
How does how does that make you feel about <coughs> prospects for the future? Well, one significant how, how you how you uh, assimilate this state of reality right now. It's hard to say, but one significant thing about it is that it's rekindled my feeling I had a long time ago before I even knew as much as I came to know that there are some defects in the concept of democracy. And I think now that systems of government need reevaluating, whether ostensibly democratic or or not. I think probably they need to remain or more likely become democratic in the sense that not just in the sense that uh, they have elections which aren't working out too well these days and often haven't worked out too well but uh, it's taken those guys uh, a good while to figure out how to blunt all of that, but they're, they're on that road now. And they'll, they'll get some more bluntness out of it, and uh, we'll get some victories, and I don't know how that's going to come out. But um, somebody I was talking to a while back, uh, without going into details, uh, said that uh, if a country has elections, it's a democracy. And uh, they had no answer for, well, what about democratic rights such as free speech and due process and things like that. That's not necessarily part of democracy. Why are those not democratic rights? I think the conversation totally broke down by then. But I think that's a thing that people need to realize as they go through the political part of their life is uh, that there's more to democracy than just having elections. And secondarily, there are some problems with democracy, as we can say from, see from those elections that I have cited in the last few minutes. And what would you think could, should be done to mitigate? Well, there's a saying that's become popular these days, which I don't like very much, but I'll throw it in right quick. That's above my pay, pay grade. No, I, I, I don't have much in the way of concrete proposals. Mm -hmm. Education is important. and. Uh, better education than the public schools are given, and different education from what private schools are given, whether in this country or elsewhere. I don't know, I don't know anything about private schools elsewhere, but uh, the problem is more than just the United States. Yeah. And education could, could cure a lot of the problem and get people to asking the right questions and having thoughts, having constructive thoughts. then implementing those constructive thoughts, of which there is no real shortage. Well, yeah, there is a shortage of what to do about democracy is not working as well as we think it does or as we claim it does. Uh, so, uh, you know, since those problems have been around for a while, I think uh, people who want to solve those problems, that s small slice of society that wants to solve those problems, is not doing a very good job of it. Needs some new ideas. And those are the ideas that I said are above my play, but my pay grade. And I don't know why I keep saying play instead of pay. Because this feels like work, it's time for play. <laughs> I, I guess so, yeah.
Well, we have covered all the ground that I can think of right now, um, but I welcome you to, to share anything further. Well, I'm pretty sure that I'll think of something that I think is worth sharing before Sunday afternoon. So I might mention it then, or we may just play. That sounds great. And if you wanted anything on down the road for the record, as we, we talked off camera yesterday, we, we welcome you to, to send something in writing that we can include with the, the well, record? Yeah, I will. Uh, we talked yesterday about including my resume. Yes. In the record. And it's occurred to me since then that I have two versions of the resume. One is the more informal one, and the other is a resume looking resume. And if I can find both of those when I get back, I'll send them both. Perfect. Well, Reber, I thank you so much number one for for taking the time and flying out here <laughs> i didn't need i didn't know before that that i needed such thanks for flying but uh stephanie straightened me out on that said so capitalism is crumbling and uh, flying is not what it used to be yeah so thank you for for subjecting yourself to that <laughs> suffering uh and for for spending all these many hours talking okay. about your life <laughs>